Hello and welcome everyone. Today's presentation is dyspnea in acute ill mechanically ventilated adult patients. This is a European Respiratory Society and European Society of Intensive Care Medicine combined statement how to manage these patients. So uh, a general overview, dyspnea or difficult breathing is described as one of the most severe forms of human suffering, often worse than pain due to the association of impending death. Now it requires universal, ethical, moral and humanitarian considerations demanding systematic identification, prevention and relief to the patient. The prevalence and challenges in mechanically ventilated patients. 30 to 50 percent of the patients on mechanical ventilator experience dyspnea due to physiological status or ventilation constraints. These patients often cannot communicate their distress leading to delayed treatment or intervention. Now, the definition, dyspnea. It is officially defined as a subjective experience of respiratory discomfort with varying sensations and intensity. It is proposed to be operationally defined as an upsetting or distressing experience of breathing awareness. It often exists without clinical, radiological or physiological abnormality, making it a primary guide for clinical management when accessible. The respiratory related brain suffering. It is defined as brain response to abnormal or misinterpreted respiratory related messages which may be actual or imaginary. Now it can occur in patients who appear unconscious also. Basically it is an interpretation of the brain of the respiratory status. The next is identified through self-reporting clinical, physiological and behavioral indicators or neurophysiological biomarkers. Now there is a persistent dyspnea or respiratory related brain suffering. It describes dyspnea or brain suffering that continues despite the corrective measure that has been done. Now it requires a paradigm shift in clinical management to focus on dyspnea as an autonomous entity necessitating brain oriented management. Now this is a brief overview. So you have some kind of a stimulus that is being sent to the brain. These are basically respiratory afferents and this can be because of an acute respiratory issue which is actually present or may, it may come from other sources like heart also but it is interpreted by the brain as if it is coming from the respiratory system. So brain perceives this increased afferent traffic and there is an increased efferent neural drive to breathe. So brain thinks that there is some respiratory issue, The brain, my lungs are not functioning normally. So it increases the frequency of breathing or modifies the breathing pattern. Now there are also corollary discharges which are again perceived at the centers. Now the processing is done where afferent reafferent balance and afferent reafferent imbalance is maintained. In this once there is balance then the sensation gradually becomes non-distressing. But if there is an imbalance there is a negative emotion associated with it which is called respiratory distress and this can be behavioral manifestations, vegetative distress which can be seen in clinical biomarkers or clinical dyspnea. Apart from that you can also have neurophysiological biomarkers which are yet to be developed. We are still working on those things. Now dyspnea is defined by the American Thoracic Society is a subjective experience of breathing discomfort with the distinct sensations varying in intensity. The current definition in ICU context may lack the emotional depth to fully convey the patient's ordeal suggesting a need for a more simpler and more impactful terminology because once we put the patient on ventilator we just presume that the breathing discomfort is gone. A proposed definition of dyspnea is the symptom that conveys an upsetting or distressing experience of breathing awareness emphasizing the multi-dimensionality and lived experience of the symptoms. So the past experience plays a very important role. The patient's past experience condition the current brain to interpret the symbols that they are getting. 
Dysnia is a symptom relying heavily on self-reporting for its identification, emphasizing the importance of not dismissing patient care based on absence of measurable physiological abnormality. So if I am not finding any physiological abnormality, but my patient says the patient has dyspnea, then it should be taken into account. The signs of respiratory distress can indicate dyspnea, but may be obscured by factors like therapeutic interventions, complicating the identification of the symptoms. Mechanically ventilated patients often face challenges in conveying these experiences due to impediments from the ventilator, non-verbal communications, or ICU acquired weakness making self-reporting unreliable in these cases. The complexity of dyspnea involves multiple physiological, psychological, social, cultural and environmental factors along with personal past experiences and expectations. The task force suggests broadening clinical reflections beyond dyspnea itself to its underlying cause to ensure comprehensive management of critically ill, mechanically ventilated patients experiencing this breathing difficulties. Now, dyspnea is a symptom resulting from the brain's perception, the cognitive processing and the emotional treatment of the abnormal physiological signals often related to respiratory, cardiovascular, muscular or metabolic issues. It is associated with the activation of the brain's networks involving motor, sensory and interoceptive regions as experienced by studies using functional magnetic resonance imaging and EEG. This brain activity during dyspnea is termed respiratory related brain suffering suggests that dyspnea is a manifestation of the brain's response to an abnormal respiratory related messages. Respiratory related brain suffering can occur even in patients who appear unconscious and may be minimally conscious challenging the assessment of their conscious state and the presence of dyspnea. Now, the concept extends to the situation where the dyspnea is anticipated or expected without an actual respiratory stimulus, similar to how pain can be experienced without nociceptive trigger. Now, the emerging recognition of respiratory-related brain suffering as an underlying cause of dyspnea highlights its importance as both as a diagnostic and therapeutic target, suggesting a shift in how dyspnea is understood and addressed. So, the pathophysiology of dyspnea and factors associated with mechanical ventilation that may affect the dyspnea. Now, the pathophysiology of dyspnea includes the mismatch between the expected and the actual sensory information of breathing with mechanical ventilation affecting the sensation through factors like ventilator assistance levels and the patient ventilator asynchrony. Now, the different forms of dyspnea like air hunger, excessive effort, chest constrictions have different causes and physiological mechanisms impacting their management in ventilated patients. Dyspnea management in mechanically ventilated patients requires a balance between the ventilatory support to address the specific sensation of the discomfort considering both perceptual and cognitive emotional aspect of the symptom. Now this is a diagram showing the perceptions of the brain. So there are afferent signals which are coming from the lungs, chest wall, airway and the chemoreceptors. All these afferent signals are going to the brain where the sensory cortex and the motor cortex is interpreting these signals and sending them to the respiratory center. From there we get two efferents. One is going to the motor cortex, the other is going to the limbic cortex. The limbic cortex is the emotional aspect of the respiratory distress and the motor cortex to increase the respiratory rates. So you have efferent signals which are being sent to the respiratory muscles by increasing the work of breathing or increasing the respiratory frequency and also the emotional aspect of it. Now here the ventilator can be doing a over assist or an under assist. So this can be an important effect in the pathophysiology of dyspnea on ventilator. So let's see what are the tools for detecting dyspnea. Now in communicative patients, self-reporting is the primary method utilizing the unidimensional tools for measuring presence and intensity of dyspnea such as the NRS that is the numerical rating scale where the patient rests a dyspnea intensity on a scale of 0 to 10 which is a very simple thing or the visual analog where the patient indicates a dyspnea on a level of 0 to 100 in a millimeter line. Similar thing 
modified box scale which links verbal descriptors to specific numbers providing a category scale with ratio properties now there are multi-dimensional tools like multi-dimensional dyspnea profile assess not just to test the intensity but also the emotional and the sensory aspect of dyspnea so this is a lot more easier in icu patients who are communicative where they can communicate with us but most of our patients are non-communicative where the problem actually starts. So we have some observational scales. They infer the presence of dyspnea based on these signs which include respiratory distress observational scale, the RDOS, which evaluates respiratory, vegetative and emotional dimensions in the dyspnea. Now intensive care RDOS and mechanical ventilator RDOS Adaptation of the RDOS for specific ICU and intubated patients needs to be used respectively. So the electrophysiological indicators are the EMG in the diaphragm and the extra diaphragmatic inspiratory muscles where the EG signals have been shown to be correlating with dyspnea but their clinical utility is still under investigation. Clinically important dyspnea, which is defined as VAS score more than 3 or NRS more than 4, this threshold is used to determine the need for intervention. It corresponds to the moderate intensity of dyspnea and is associated with poorer patient outcomes. So, how do we assess this? If the patient can talk, just ask. If the patient is intubated and cannot talk, we can use other methods where they can indicate to us and if they are still communicating with us, then we can use those communication skills to get the dyspnea skills. If the patient is unconscious, in that case, look for the observational scales that we have already told or the work is still under development, the neurophysiological biomarkers. Now, if in doubt, ask, look and measure whatever context you have and always monitor the patients to trigger the patient caregiver interaction if the patient cannot communicate intentionally or if the caregiver is not present at the bedside then we can use certain monitoring tools which are still being under development the problem due to dyspnea the problem due to dyspnea in the short term is the immediate suffering the fear of death the strong association with the anxiety in the middle term a weaning difficulty a increased risk of weaning failure and finally, long term, after a prolonged ICU stay, there will be dark recollections about the ICU stay, high prevalence of a post-traumatic stress disorder, especially if there are multiple exposures like this. Now, interventions to relieve the dyspnea. In this, the management considerations are communication. It is crucial to reassure the patient about the condition, the dyspnea management. Poor communication can exacerbate the patient's distress. The sense of control enhance the patient's sense of control over the situation including allowing them some control over ventilator setting or participation in the care activity which may mitigate the dyspnea non-respiratory stimulus managing factors like fever acidosis that stimulate the respiratory drive respiratory mechanics address abnormalities in the respiratory mechanics such as low compliance and high resistance and optimize your ventilatory strategy finally ventilator settings adjust the setting for better matching with the patient's respiratory drive reducing the patient ventilator asynchrony and the sensation of dyspnea now you can use the extracorporeal lung support studies have demonstrated that facilitating co2 removal through ECMO can reduce the respiratory load, thus potentially elevating dyspnea in a lot of cases. Increasing V, v ECMO, decreasing the respiratory drive while reducing it increases the drive, indicating a direct relationship between the CO2 removal and the respiratory effort or the dyspnea sensation. Pharmacological approaches. First is opioids, they are effective in reducing the sensation of dyspnea with guidelines supporting their use when dyspnea persists despite optimal treatment. Concerns about respiratory depression are less significant in intubated patients while studies with morphine can decrease dyspnea without adversely affecting the respiratory parameters. Use of anxiolytics. There is a strong in link between anxiety and dyspnea. Medications that elevate anxiety can reduce the sensation of dyspnea. Cannabinoids and nebulized diuretics. Potential benefit in dyspnea management, though evidence is limited or controversial. Non pharmacological interventions that target the brain's processing of the dyspnea, such as exposure to relaxing music, directed airflow to the face. So, promise in reducing the emotional and affect component of the dyspnea without toxicity. Other techniques like chest wall vibration, acupuncture, relaxation techniques, neuroelectrical muscles. Con stimulation have been explored but their benefits are still under evaluation.
So just a brief summary, if the patient is in ICU, first check for the CAM ICU. And if the patient is not having any delirium and is communicative, then check for the presence of dyspnea. If there is no dyspnea, then patient need, just needs monitoring. If there is dyspnea, then check if it is clinically significant. If it is not clinically significant, we just need to monitor. If it is clinically significant, then use the relieving measures as told. Now, if the patient is non-communicative, these are the scoring systems. As we have already described, these are to be used. If they are non-mechanically ventilated and these are the score that is RDOS is more than 3 or the intensive care RDOS is more than 2.4, then we must go for relieving symptoms. Now, in ventilated patients, if the RDOS is more than or equal to 3 or mechanical ventilated is more than 2.6, you do. So, this is a stepwise approach. How do we treat and elevate the dyspnea in these cases? Proactively look for dyspnea and respiratory related brain suffering. So, once you have done that assessment with all your scales and all, try to find if there is a dyspnea and quantify it. If it is clinically significant, then consider correcting the correctable things like fever, acidosis, allay the anxiety, reassure the patient, communicate with the patient, relieve the pain if significant. Now correct the abnormal respiratory impedance like re minimize the airway resistance, use suctioning, bronchodilators, maximize the compliance if there is any atelectasis, pruditis or pneumothorax, treat it. Adjust the ventilatory settings, consider switching to pressure support modes, increase inspiratory flow, offset intrinsic PEEP with external PEEP, correct the aggravating hypoxemia. So these are some basic steps which can be taken by increasing the flow, changing to a more spontaneous mode of ventilation, treating the intrinsic PEEP and correcting the oxygenation. Then you can use the non-pharmacological methods like relaxing music, fresh air to the face. This can be easily done. The next is the use of pharma. If after all this, you still can't control, only and only then use the opioids and finally again quantify and see how the scores have changed over the interventions that you have done so to summarize and to end the presentation these are some of the tips that will help explain what is happening to the patient even if they are unresponsive and apparently unable to communicate reassure the patients that we have understood that they are suffering from dyspnea Reassure the patient that dyspnea is an expected consequence of the condition and the condition is being monitored and that being dyspneic does not necessarily mean that condition is worsening or they are going to die. This is very very important. Reassure the patient that they are not going to die. Coach dyspneic patients to adapt or adapt to try to adopt a slower breathing pattern. Remain with them as they practice this. Give time frames, for example, tomorrow morning we will turn down the, the ventilator and see how you are managing your breathing. So give them a time frame so that they can adjust their mental thinking and wait until that time. Facilitate non-verbal communication methods for patients who are unable to speak. Help patients adjust to the non-invasive ventilation by starting at a low level and gradually titrating to a higher setting. Allow patients control over experience where possible. For example, allow them to adjust the ventilator settings or participate in the suctioning. Explain what is happening to the patient's family so that they can also be assured and provide reassurance to the patients. So thank you for your patience. Dyspnea in ventilated patients is very very important. Allowing their anxiety and treating it sooner reduces the incidence of weaning failure and the post-traumatic stress disorder associated with the ICU state. Thank you for your patience.